Welcome to ESC TV here in Barcelona. My name is Christian Müller. I'm a professor of cardiology at the University Hospital in Basel, and I'm accompanied by a very important person today, Professor Willems, uh, Wilfried Mullins uh, from Belgium, the principal investigator of the ATWOR study. Welcome here in the studio, Wilfried. It's fantastic to have you here to discuss with you one-to-one -one the fantastic uh, study that you have performed with uh, the outstanding results published in parallel in the New England Journal of Medicine. May I ask you to briefly summarize the clinical problem that was kind of the starting point for your study, please? Yeah. Well, again, thank you for the introduction, Christian, for the nice words. Um, so what we actually studied was a patient population for which there is basically no good treatment available. We specifically looked at patients who were hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure. And as you know, we have been doing many trials in the past, and all of these trials failed to achieve their primary endpoint, which was sometimes hospitalization or decongestion, and that is a patient population in which we're really lacking good medical treatment. So acute patients with acute dyspnea presenting to the emergency department and then hospitalized. So can you please summarize what was the strategy or the new drug, the innovation that you tested <coughs> in your study? Yeah. So normally if these patients are admitted to the hospital, what physicians do worldwide is giving intravenous loop diuretic therapy. So what we thought is we're gonna compare the standardized intravenous loop diuretic therapy with our thinking, our physiological reasoning was that that therapy would be ineffective because the therapy loop diuretics work really distal in the nephron. And if we would combine that with a diuretic agent that works more proximal, we might boost loop diuretic efficacy. So the standard group was standardized intravenous loop diuretic therapy plus placebo and the intervention was the same amount of loop diuretic therapy plus acetazolamide. And acetazolamide is a very old drug that blocks carbon anhydrase in the proximal parts, and we've shown previously that that boosts the natriuretic response of loop diuretic therapy. So we did that for three days, and then the primary endpoint was, is your patient decongested at, after three days of consecutive diuretic therapy? We trained the physicians to do a good examination of congestion. So they had to examine the patient clinically to assess for edema on the legs, and they also had to evaluate if there was ascites or pleural effusion. And we forced them to use technical examination to rule that out, either by echo or by chest X-ray. After those three days, we looked at the primary endpoint, and not to our surprise, but we found out that we had a tremendous benefit of the drug. 46% more patients were dry in the intervention group. Fantastic to have finally a positive randomized controlled trial in acute heart failure. So again, congratulations for this uh, major achievement. Um, so likely the benefit was uh, by having uh, higher urine output in those patients uh, additionally receiving acetazolamide. Can you quantify what was the additional uh, weight loss or uh, urine uh, output achieved over the first three or five days? Yeah, what is really interesting here in this study, and it's also novel, Christian, I think is we, look, we took a comprehensive assessment of congestion and you could see that there was an incremental benefit of the drug over consecutive days. And this benefit, you could not make that up after a couple of days. So we also looked, for example, at the rates of decongestion at discharge, and it was really clear that this, the benefit was sustained. We feel, based on the data that we just presented, that that was based on the more important increase in natriuresis. Yeah. So acetazolamide does not only lead to more diuresis, but the increase in natriuresis was more spectacular. These patients already in the first two days peed out more than four grams of additional sodium chloride. And we feel that that is the way to move things forward. We have to treat this problem acutely and aggressively. 
because you cannot make up the time that you're going to lose in the beginning. And like I was referring to, our interventional doctors learned us the, the door to PCI time, door to balloon time. With diuretics, we should do the same. It's door to combo diuretic time. And the combination now should be loop diuretics plus acetazolamide. Absolutely. So um, please, uh, um, let's try to put the endpoint that you have achieved into perspective with the other endpoints that uh, were previously used in uh, the studies. Uh, if I recall correctly, there was no effect of the intervention on death, all cause death over the next um, months. Mm -hmm. And there was no effect on acute heart failure rehospitalization, possibly, uh, uh, I think, for the combination, uh, mm -hmm. even a, a point estimate in the wrong direction. And there was no effect on the patient reported outcome. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you had as a secondary endpoint uh, a reduction in the length of stay. Uh, how can you put these? findings into perspective with the clear benefit regarding the congestion score? Yeah, I think first I think you're completely right to what you were alluding to. So there was a significant reduction in hospitalization duration. Uh, please remember this was a placebo controlled double blind trial. So this will save money and this will also probably lead to better quality of life. The reason what you're alluding to, we measured the quality of life through EQ 5D questionnaires. We know now, we also knew previously, that that is probably not the best metric to measure quality of life. But we're physicians, Christian, you and I. We see these patients every day in our wards, and we know that they're suffocating from the water, and if you can make that disappear better and more rapidly, this will automatically lead to an improved feeling, improved quality of life. You are correct to say that we did not reach the secondary endpoint of heart failure hospitalization and all-cause mortality reduction. But I have to say that this, this trial was, of course, not power to do so. We only included 520 patients. If you look at trials that are powered for this endpoint, you would need four or 5,000 patients to do so. Also, very importantly, in the DOSE trial, which is the only randomized trial that we had previously, which only included 300 patients, they saw an incidence of this combined endpoint of up to 50% at two months. In our trial, it was only 28%. The reason for that is that the physicians did an utmost good job to get these patients dry, still better with the cetazolamide at the discharge, and also they uptitrated medical therapy better or in a good manner compared to other trials. So this is also a testimony that the physicians in Belgium do practice what the guidelines actually preach, that you have to optimize medical therapy. And that's the way we should be looking at acute heart failure. The first problem is the volume. Get it out with diuretic therapy, and then you install the goodies, the good medical therapy, the disease, the disease programs, rehabilitation unit, optimization of device use, and that's exactly what has been done in this trial. So you, you clearly uh, highlighted the value of combination diuretic therapy. So um, please let's move the discussion on kind of two additional options in order to increase uh, diuresis and naturesis. And uh, one that has been or is commonly used in our clinical practice is the combination with metallosone or other thiothid uh, diuretics. Um, so if I remember correctly, the, the use of metallosone was not allowed in the study. Mm -hmm. Could you speculate whether you think your findings of the substantial added value uh, of your interventions would still apply in a standard of care that would use metallosone in addition to yep. the loop diuretic in those cases who uh, patients that do not achieve the target weight loss, the target uh, increase in naturesis and diuresis uh, set by the physicians? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so thiazides, we, we did not exclude them. So if patients were on thiazides, we should, should just continue them. We just didn't allow to add them in the first days. They could be added as an escalation bailout therapy after two consecutive days if the diuretic response was insufficient. We have to bear in mind that there's never ever been a trial with thiazides like ADFOR. 
So you can only hypothesize, but ADVAR is the first trial to show an improvement in decongestive, uh, in, de in the decongestion endpoint. Thiazides, you have to absorb them through your gut. The absorption is lower if you have edema of the bowel. Secondly, thiazides have been associated on, in every observational study with an increase in iron disturbances and even an increase in mortality in propensity matched analysis. So thiazides are not a safe drug to use. While acetazolamide is very effective and there was absolutely zero signal of harm. So I do understand the question, but I don't think that this is relevant for clinical practice. Thiazides also take a long time before they work and we need to treat it aggressively, acutely. So if you give a thiazide in the emergency room, the drug will work not e sooner than 12 hours after you delivered it. So I don't think there's a comparison needed between the two drugs currently. Okay, so metallosone done. I'm not saying it's yes. done. But from but I, I, I fully support your point and your argumentation. So I think yeah. for me this is done. Yeah. SGLT2 inhibitors, so that if to some extent uh, the major innovation for us as heart failure physicians yep. and for our patients. Now, how would you uh, put into perspective uh, and answer the questions, is it clear that we still would have uh, the same added value of acetazolamide if added to the oral dose of the SGLT2 inhibitor, which at least in Several very recent studies have shown similar uh, added value regarding um, urine output uh, as endpoint or even the clinical benefit in the study from um, Adrian. Yeah, okay. So SGLT2 inhibitors were, were not allowed in our study. There are reasons for that. We started the study before there was any indication of SGLT2 in heart failure, and we did not want to have different groups of SGLT2 utilization. So that's the reason why we excluded that. I think we have to think differently. Heart failure is a disease which we attack on different combination of drugs, on different targets. SGLT2 emitters work in the proximal tubule, just like acetazolamide, but in a completely different way. SGLT2 block glucose uptake and is maximum responsible for 5% of sodium uptake. And that is what Adrian Voors also showed. It gives more diuresis but not more natriuresis. Acetazolamide interferes with the sodium proton exchanger which blocks 60% of the sodium uptake. So I would look at them differently. SGLT2 is for everybody and you will save lives with it. SGLT2 inhibitors are probably not the drug to be used as a, as a diuretic. They're used as a neuromodulator, while acetazolamide is a drug to be used acutely, a couple of days, to help decongest your patient. So I believe they will have a synergistic effect, and again, there is no safety issue of combining both of these drugs. Excellent. So I think we have now about still five minutes to go. I would like to open the discussion and ask those of you who have a question to be raised uh, to Professor Mullins to come to the mic and then uh, to introduce yourself. So until the first person in the audience is uh, ready, uh, I have the question to you. I mean, uh, the drug is also available in oral format. So uh, some of you and some of uh, perhaps yep. you have uh, used it uh, uh, as in the indication to prevent high altitude mountain yep. sickness. Uh, I think usually we take 500, uh, 250 so milligrams honest, in the yep. other indication. Do you see an indication also for the oral preparation um, or you, you would stick exactly to the trial yep. protocol and only the intravenous route uh, with the 500 milligram dose for the first three to five days? I would stick to the protocol because that's been proven now and we are scientists, we should not speculate about other things. We also don't have safety data about long-term use of the drug. We don't have data about oral absorption if you have acute heart failure. So I would really stick to the protocol. And again, acute heart failure is getting rid of the congestion and then the other medical stuff should start. Excellent. Please. Thank you. My name is Luis Beck da Silva from Brazil. Uh, First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, for the initiative, execution, and, and, and finishing this great study. And uh, my questions are actually two questions. Uh, 
We have performed a thiazide uh, small clinical trial ourselves, and we got results of positive uh, decongestion as well. It's an 80 patients trial, one center, and it was placebo controlled. Uh, we definitely use as a add up uh, add uh, on uh, therapy the thiazides in our heart failure patients almost every day. The other thing <coughs> is that we only have acetazolamide oral in Brazil. So my question is, should I combine all, all this knowledge, maybe thiazides and acetazolamide oral, and plus ISSLL22? I think for SGLT2, it's clear. You should just give it to everybody. There's a no-brainer. That's been proven now over and over again. For the other drugs, those are drugs to decongest the patient. A little bit contrary to what you might expect, I would say it doesn't really matter how you decongest your patient as long as he is decongested in a safe manner. We now have the first time proven that acetazolamide helps to do that in a safe manner. If you can do that with a thiazide and a prospective trial like we did, fine for me, then I will use it as well. So I'm not saying you should not do it, but I think you should now stick to the scientific data that we have and that is supporting acetazolamide. Acetazolamide would be the second diuretics and thiazide the third or fourth. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, so if that's another question, please. Yes, indicate yourself and raise the question to Professor Mullins. Hi, uh, congratulations for your work. It's really impressive. My name is Marcelo. I'm also from Brazil. I'm a general cardiologist. Uh, I also have a split two questions. First, uh, your sample uh, was a mix of preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction. I wanted to know if you did any kind of subgroup analysis or if you feel that the effect of the cetazolamide would be different in this two uh, spectrum of heart failure patients. So um, we combined all the patients because phenotypically they look similar. We just published the baseline characteristics of the, of the patients, and the only difference outside from ejection fraction is their anti-proBNP levels. They were higher in the half rev than in the half pef group, but they were still really, really high in both groups. But phenotypically, they look similar. That's also been shown over and over again. In the analysis that were, in the main analysis, there was no, uh, no interaction of ejection fraction, but we'll do more sub analysis to actually show that more in detail. Thank you. And uh, for the second part, uh, I know that it was also safe, uh, but when you see the combined uh, renal endpoints, uh, maybe due to the small sample size, it was a 2.8 versus 0 0.8, which was a 2% higher, yeah. not statistically significant. But do you see this as a signal or a tendency, or do you just think that this might, might be just a type 1 error because, you do, you, because yeah. of the small sample size? Uh, of course, now we looked at the patients, so we know who they are. And it's about it's two patients out of 519, which is the difference. And those two patients came in in cardiogenic, not in cardiogenic shock. Their blood pressure was still a little bit above 90, but they developed cardiogenic shock within 24 hours. And they went on to dialysis. So I think it's more a play of chance. Thank you. So for practical reasons, so is the drug an intravenous formulation? Um, was it done specifically for the study, or there's a commercially, uh, they are commercially available for all of us for clinical yeah. use? So in, in Belgium, they're available for both, and the drug is registered as a heart failure drug, as a diuretic. So that it should not happen that a company is going to buy the patent and say, we have a new drug. So it is a licensed drug, at least in Europe, for heart failure, for a diuretic use. But again, we only have data now for IV use, so I would stick to the intravenous utilization. Yeah, the intravenous formulation is widely available. So it's that widely we can available. Ask yeah. the hospital pharmacists in our institution to get this on board. Exactly. To replicate your uh, fantastic yeah. uh, results in our patients, uh, in your patients, so the combination therapy that has clearly shown beneficial effects uh, in the Edward study. Yeah. So with that, uh, we're have uh, had a great discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Wilfried, for educating us on the details of the study. Again, congratulations for your fantastic study to have achieved an investigator-initiated study in acute heart failure and to propose to us and uh, for all of you combination therapy, including acetolamide, acetolamide uh, 500 milligrams a day as the combination therapy to be used. Thank you very much, Wilfried, yeah. and thank you very much for attending.